Happy Sunday, church. I'm so glad that you're here worshiping with us, and I'm super excited to share God's word. Have you ever been surprised to find out that someone is a Christian? Um, maybe it just came up in conversation. You're talking with a coworker, and your coworker shared that he or she goes to church and is a believer. But instead of thinking to yourself, you know what, that really makes sense. You know, I should have known that. Instead, you're, you're kind of taken aback because nothing that this person does or says gives any kind of indication that, that they're a believer. I remember a long time ago, this was right out of high school and um, right, right at the beginning of my Christian faith. I bumped into one of my old high school friends at the gas station down the street from my house and we, we just started catching up a little bit and I told my friend that I had been going to church and I'd been really busy with serving. And my friend, he says to me, he says, you know what, man, that's pretty cool. I'm actually a disciple myself. And I'm going to be honest, that caught me off guard because I have known this person for six years or so. I played football with him for four years. I have gone to parties with him. I, I know his history with women. I um, have heard him talk and the, his, I've seen his priorities, and there just wasn't anything about his life that would give me an indication that he was a believer. And I know for a fact that he didn't just get saved recently because he said he was a disciple. So he's using sophisticated Christian language here. And so I was genuinely surprised to hear that my friend of mine, who I knew very, I thought I knew very well, was a Christian. Now, what about you? Think about your friends, your coworkers, or your peers. Would they be surprised to hear that you're a Christian based just on the way you live, the way you talk to people, the way you treat people? Or would it be obvious to them because of the way you live your life? Today, if you're just joining us, we're continuing our new sermon series, First, it's actually, it's on First and Second Peter, and it's called Greater Destiny. Okay, so essentially, as God's chosen people, our greater destiny consists of hope, holiness, and hardship. And Pastor Steffi shared an amazing message last week, and he added joy to that list as well. He said joy is part of our destiny in Christ. Two weeks ago, if you were here, we learned that we're called to live as foreigners and exiles as we wait for our inheritance from Jesus Christ. And one of the verses we read was 1 Peter 2, verses 11 to 12. And it says, Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. A key principle we took from that message two weeks ago was that the world is not our home, but it's our mission field. And that we're supposed to live our lives in such a way that we actually attract people to Jesus and so that they give glory to God. We're supposed to, to live as foreigners and exiles for the glory of God. And so that's what I want to reflect on a little bit more today. This idea of living as foreigners and exiles for a specific purpose. So let's begin. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. And I'll go ahead and, and get started. So it says, verse 1, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. 
but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge both the living and the dead. For this reason, the gospel was preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of a sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So a few things going on here. In this passage, Peter exhorts his audience to arm themselves with Christ's attitude so that they can fulfill their calling to be a holy nation in a hostile world. And basically, their calling boils down to two things in this passage. One, to reject the reckless and sinful life, lifestyle uh, that characterizes the surrounding world. And second, to basically build a Christ-like community through love, hospitality, and service. Essentially, we as Christians can fulfill our calling and we can be witnesses to the world around us in, by doing two things. First, by being countercultural, by rejecting sin, uh, sinful actions and behaviors. And second, by building a Christ-like community, as I said. Neither of these, by the way, is easy. Whether you're rejecting sin, whether you're trying to foster a community of love and service, both of those are really hard. And so that's why Peter starts with the command to arm yourselves with Christ's attitude, his attitude which was willing to suffer for the will of God. What we're going to learn today is that the price tag of submission is a life of suffering. But through submission, our pain brings glory to God. So I'll say it one more time. We're going to learn that the price tag of submission is a life of suffering. But through submission, our pain brings glory to God. So let's, let's kind of drill down those first two verses and reflect on them a little bit more. So at the beginning, he says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude. So the passage starts off with the command, arm yourselves with the attitude of Christ. And he makes a clear reference to Christ's suffering. And so when we think about the life of Jesus, what we see is that Jesus was willing to do anything or endure anything to be obedient to God. Jesus was willing to suffer in order to be obedient. In fact, Christ Jesus, he obeyed God's will even to the point of death. And so Peter commands us to, to have that same attitude, an attitude of total submission and surrender, an attitude that is willing to endure suffering for the faith. Notice here that Peter uses warfare language. He says, arm yourselves with this kind of attitude. This is warfare language. And what he's saying is that having Christ's attitude, it equips us for our battle against sin and temptation. And it empowers us to reject sin and to surrender to God's will, even when it's painful. 
And so I believe that this passage teaches us that you cannot embrace God's will until you embody Christ's attitude. And essentially, Christ's attitude was this. Lord, I am willing to submit to you regardless of the cost, no matter the pain, and even though it'll cost me everything. And Christ had this attitude because submission to God's will, it comes at a cost. It's painful at times, and it will cost you everything. So the first thing I want us to take away from this passage that I think is really important for us is that a willingness to submit starts with a willingness to suffer. If you are not willing to suffer for your faith, you will not be able to submit to the will of God. You will compromise if you're not willing to suffer. Now, I think the same reason why so many Christians struggle in their relationship with Christ is the same reason why so many couples struggle in their marriage. So a lot of couples, they, in, they enter into marriage thinking that it's just going to be all fun, thinking that it's going to fulfill all their deepest desires or it's going to take care of all their insecurities and get rid of all of their problems. But then when they get into marriage, they find out that marriage is hard work. They find out that there's times when you're going to bump heads with your spouse. There's going to be times when you guys disagree or you have to have tough conversations. There's going to be times when your wife in the middle of the night kicks you in your sleep. And I know from experience. And so they fail because they're, they go into it with the wrong attitude. And just to be clear, I think marriage is wonderful. It's beautiful. I love being married. But again, it's not easy. It takes hard work. And so only those who have, or only those who are armed with the right attitude can make it. You know, I remember when I was doing my, my marriage counseling with Pastor Danny and Chimay. Uh, man, I really appreciated everything that they taught uh, Michelle and I. Um, they taught us how to communicate effectively, how to resolve conflict with one another, how we could serve each other. But in all the weeks that we did marriage counseling, it all could be boiled down to basically this, that marriage is hard. And so don't get married unless you're willing to commit for better or for worse. And in the same way, when it comes to our relationship with Jesus, we need to enter into that relationship with the right attitude, with the right mindset and the right expectations. Now, don't get me wrong. Again, there is no greater gift than knowing that you have been saved from the captivity and condemnation of sin. But that doesn't mean that rejecting sin is always easy. There's no better life than living at the center of God's will. And yet, that doesn't mean submitting to God's will is always easy pain-free. In fact, there will be a time when obedience to God requires you to upset people, to have uncomfortable conversations. Maybe perhaps because you're not willing to go along with someone, someone you care about, and participate in their sin. And so we need to know that obedience to God comes at a price. We have, to, we have to know that obedience to God comes at a price. But if we arm ourselves with Christ's attitude, we'll be well equipped to overcome the challenges that come with real discipleship. Okay, so we need to have Christ's attitude. His attitude of total surrender and commitment to God's will. His attitude that said, Lord, I'm willing to suffer out of my obedience for you. And so only those who embody God's or embody Christ's attitude can embrace God's will. And this reminds me of when, when Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. And again, he's about to go to the cross. And he, and he says something to the Father that I think 
really captures this attitude that we're supposed to embody as well. He said, he said to the Father, if you can take this cup away from me, if you can, if you're willing, take this cup away from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. He said, Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, but not my will, but yours be done. He said, not my will, but yours be done. Now, I want us to take a moment and, you know, we're at the beginning of a new year. I'm sure we have a lot of desires and, and hopes and things we're hoping to experience or accomplish this year. But I want to ask you, are you willing to say that prayer? Are you willing, you know, thinking about your life, the decisions you make, the way you spend your money, the way you prioritize your time, the way you treat people, are you willing to say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And the reason I ask that is because this passage tells us that we need to have Christ's attitude. And so I think that prayer is a great place to start. Lord, not my will, but yours be done. And we need to have this attitude because like I said, submission to God's will has consequences as we see in the following verses. So in verse, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3 to 6, he says, For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you, that you do not join them in their reckless, uh, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. And for this reason, the gospel is preached even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. So why do we need to arm ourselves with the mind of Christ? In this passage, Peter explains that as believers, we have been delivered from our old sinful life of revelry and rebellion. And we have been delivered from this way of life that basically characterizes the rest of the world. And so as a consequence, believers, when they reject their old way of life, they, they shock the surrounding world. And they, they shock the world by their countercultural lifestyle. And what happens is they invite criticism from unbelievers. And so as we submit to God's will, we can expect to experience ridicule and alienation from the world. And this is one of the, like I said, this is one of the consequences that comes with obedience to God. Now, thankfully, Peter provides provide some reassurance that, that those who judge us in the present will be judged by Christ in the future. And that no matter how badly we're ridiculed for our faith, we will be vindicated when Christ returns. And he uses, uh, interestingly, he uses believers who have passed away as an example. So he says, consider believers who have been Passed, who have passed away, who have died. They may have been ridiculed even up to the point of their death. But what does it matter now? It doesn't matter because now, even though they died being ridiculed, they are alive in Christ. That they have, they have received their inheritance of eternal life. And so we need to arm ourselves with Christ's attitude because our rejection of sin will shock the world and invite ridicule. Believe it or not, there will be times when your refusal to participate in sin will offend people. And here's why. Your rejection of sin is an implicit condemnation of the world. Think about it. If everyone was just partaking in sinful behavior, then no one would think twice about it because everyone's doing the same thing. But the second you have a group of people who say no, 
who reject sin and live in a way that is different from the surrounding culture, suddenly the world has to think about their own lifestyle. And suddenly they're confronted with their own sin. And the response, more often than not, is going to be hostility. Now, when I think about this passage, I realize something. The church should be controversial. That's right. You heard me correctly. I believe 100% the church should be controversial. But if we're looking at this passage, the church should be controversial for the right reasons. Sadly, too often, at least from what I see in, uh, in my interactions with people on social media, too often the world criticizes the church not for being too godly, but for actually being too worldly. Think about it. Every time I see the church, most of the time, I see the, 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 I'm sorry, most of the time I see the world criticizing the church, it's for things like scandals. It's because the church is greedy. It's because Christians and their lives aren't, aren't practicing what they preach. And so, yes, the church is, is called to be countercultural and even controversial, but it should be for the right reasons. It should be because of their holiness. And so I want to state right now that, that we should be controversial, not for being compromised, but for being Christ-like. We should be controversial because of our holiness, not our hypocrisy. The church should not be controversial because we're, our, our church is full of scandals or because we're greedy or because we're being hypocritical. We should be controversial because we're living holy lives that confront the world with their sin. Another problem is, is that many, many believers, they'll, they'll water down their devotion for the sake of avoiding this conflict that is, is bound to happen. And so what they'll do is they'll, they'll change their, their words, they'll change their values in order to blend in. But scripture says we have spent enough time living like the world. And so we need to embrace our new life and we need to dare to stand out no matter what the consequences may be. Remember, if the world rejects us, we are accepted by God. If unbelievers ridicule us, Christ is our defender. And if our holiness should lead to hardship, the Spirit will be our helper. You know, I'm not, um, if you follow me on Instagram or you're friends with me on Facebook, one thing that you'll notice is that I'm not very active on social media. And there's a reason for that. It's not because I'm, you know, too busy. It's not because I don't want to post things. It's because, you know, I'll be sitting at home and all of a sudden, you know, I might get a, an idea for maybe a funny or a witty tweet. And so I'll, I'll get my phone and I'll, I'll type out this idea I have or maybe this funny joke or something. And I'll type it out and then I'll go to click the, the post button. And right when I'm about to click post, I hear a voice. And that voice says, that's not really funny. What you're about to post is pretty dumb. What if people make fun of you? What if people don't respond well? What if you get ratioed and people just make fun of you on, on, on Twitter? Or what if people think your caption is, is stupid or it's dumb? And so what happens is I'll, I won't post. And instead I'll, I'll rework my tweet or my caption and I'll change it and I'll, I'll make adjustments to it and I'll just edit it over and over and over again until, you know, what started as something genuinely original, you know, maybe funny, maybe not, what started as genuinely original becomes something safe, generic, and ultimately boring. And in the same way, so often Christians, 
they'll edit their devotion in order to blend in. They'll edit their devotion so they don't catch, you know, too much attention or they don't start controversy. They'll edit their devotion. They'll edit their words. They'll edit their values. They'll edit their decisions so they don't have to stand out. And what happens when we do that is we lose everything that makes us different. We lose everything that makes us stand out and, and actually, you know, spark interest in people. To use the words of our Lord, we lose our saltiness and we end up hiding our light under a lampshade. Let me just say this. If you are a Christian, you will have opportunities to stand out. Whether it's among your circle of friends, at work, or even amongst your family members. If you are a believer, you will have opportunities to stand out. It might, you know, when, when your peers are cheating, you'll have an opportunity to be honest. When, when your friends are maybe talking in a derogatory or inappropriate way about someone of the opposite sex, you'll have an opportunity to speak up. When the people around you are gossiping and grumbling and complaining, you'll have an opportunity to excuse yourself. When the people around you are engaging in sinful behavior, you'll have the opportunity to shine your light by not participating. But the moment that opportunity presents itself, there's going to be that temptation to edit your devotion, to water down your commitment to God's will for the sake of blending in. Church, resist that temptation. Dare to stand out. Have courage, even if it, you know, even if it's uh, met with hostility and opposition, because that is what we're called to do. So I want to ask you, think about your different um, circles of influence, the different situations you find yourself in during the week. And I want you to ask yourself, and maybe bring this in prayer, you know, how are you tempted to edit your Christianity? How are you tempted to water it down? And I want you to ask a hard question. Could someone ridicule you for being faithful? Could someone accuse you or ridicule you for your holiness? Or do you live in such a way that you barely stand out? Again, I want to encourage you, you know, and I want to be clear, I'm not saying that we should be obnoxious or unnecessarily combative, but we shouldn't blend in so much that we, people can't even tell we're Christian. We should live lives that are, are holy and holy in a way that is raw and unapologetic. And so this is why we need to arm ourselves with Christ's attitude because as we reject sin, people are going to ridicule us and we need to have the courage to, to endure that ridicule and to stand our ground. But that's not all. In 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 7 to 11, he writes, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of a sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, Love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. And if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So in this last section, Peter starts by reminding his audience to live their lives in light of the future. And since the end is near, believers should be alert and they should pray. But then he says, he commands the audience to love each other 
above all. And this love can be expressed through hospitality that is given willingly without grumbling and service, the use of spiritual gifts for the good of others. Now, what's really interesting here is if we look at the whole passage, we have two, we have, uh, two pictures of community. In the previous passage, we have a picture of community that is defined by sin, where people, they, they take advantage of one another and they exploit one another for their own selfish desires. Okay, so we have one picture of community defined by sin, defined by orgies, defined by um, uh, debauchery, reckless living. Again, where people are, they use one another. And in here, we have a second picture of community that's not defined by sin, but love. And where people don't take advantage of each other, but they serve one another and they care for each other. And so we have this contrast. And again, by living this way, the church has an opportunity to stand out. And so we have this picture here. And and Peter says that when the church loves one another in this way, believers become channels of God's grace and they bring glory to God. Remember I read at the beginning of this passage, 1 Peter 2, verse 11 to 12, and, I, and it says, you know, live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing evil, they'll see your good deeds and bring glory to God. Notice how at the end here, he kind of uses that similar language. He says, treat one another this way so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ and to him be the glory and the power forever and ever. So Peter, he echoes by talking about the glory of God. He echoes that earlier verse. And by doing that, what he's, what he's essentially doing is he's, he's highlighting the missional purpose of Christian conduct. In other words, the church is called to serve one another in community for the sake of bringing people to Christ. And so if our holy life invites ridicule, our loving relationships invites, uh, invites curiosity. It draws people in. And so what this passage teaches us is that our lives should be convicting and our relationships should be captivating. And so what we learn here is that God uses our holy lives to to turn people's heads, to get their attention, to make them uncomfortable. And he uses Christian relationships, Christian community, not to turn their heads, but to change their hearts and to draw them in. And so God uses both godly conduct and loving relationships to make the church a powerful witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And notice that Christian community, it draws people in when it's defined by three things, love, hospitality, and service. And so if this is the kind of if these are the kind of characteristics that, that make an attractive church, we need to talk briefly about each one. So when it comes to love, Peter says, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. And so what, what Peter is emphasizing here is he's emphasizing love as a commitment that is willing to forgive. And I'm reminded of Proverbs 10, 12, where it says, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers all wrongs. That's Proverbs 10, verse 12. And I'm sure Peter had that verse in mind when he wrote this. And so love, the kind of love that attracts people is love that forgives and is willing to commit to people despite their mistakes. But let's talk about hospitality. Hospitality, when we think of hospitality, we think having someone over for dinner, giving them coffee, maybe treating them to, uh, to food of some kind, being nice, maybe playing games for a little bit, you know, inviting them over to your house. But the biblical understanding of hospitality is it's the act of welcoming others into your life with selfless intentions. 
Okay, so one scholar describes hospitality as welcoming strangers into your life, especially the disadvantaged, not on the basis of what they can provide you, but on the basis of how you can serve them. And so this is the biblical picture of hospitality. It's basically taking people into your care for selfless motivations. And, you know, during the first century, to give you an idea of what it might have looked like, during the first century, you know, people traveled a lot, but they didn't have, you know, Motel 6. They didn't have nice hotels. And so when you were traveling through town, you had to rely on the hospitality of strangers. And sometimes you might find a mutual friend in the town that you were passing through and you would stay the night at that person's house. And so in the first century, you could be a Christian and another Christian who is passing through your town might show up to your house unexpected. Maybe you haven't even met this person before and they would ask for you to take them in to your, into, their, into your care. And they would ask you to provide them uh, shelter for the night and food. And if you had the means, you would do it. No prior notice. This person would, would most likely be a stranger. And maybe all you had was a letter from a mutual friend vouching for this person. And that's what hospitality looked like. Christians would, would take people into their care and would give them lodging for the night. Now, I don't think that's necessary today. Usually, you know, we, we have hotels today, but, but the picture here is that hospitality is more than buying someone dinner. It's meeting someone's needs out of a selfless place, out of a place of just genuine love and concern. And so that's the kind of hospitality that, that attracts people. And I remember I experienced this kind of hospitality when I went to summer mission in 2012. I remember the last place we went to, um, I can't remember the, the name of the city, but for this, the place that we were, for this town, they didn't have a motel. And so the whole team of maybe over 20 people had to stay in people's homes. But the people who were taking us in, they didn't have, you know, big homes most of them didn't even have running water. And yet, they took us into their care. They didn't have much, but they offered what they had. They met our needs. They gave us a place to sleep and food to eat. And you know, I bet that that was a powerful testimony to the unbelievers in their town. I bet that that led people to come to our outreach events because they saw something that to them seems supernatural, out of the ordinary. And that something was biblical hospitality. And lastly, we have gifts, spiritual gifts and service. And basically here, what we see is that, that God gives, he gives spiritual gifts, which are basically different abilities to meet a diverse range of needs in the church. And, the, and when we use these abilities for the common good to meet people's needs, then again, the world takes notice and people are drawn to the church. And so by embodying these three attributes, love, hospitality, and service, we show the world a powerful picture of the gospel. We give them a picture of the gospel that is beautiful and captivating when we develop relationships that are characterized not by selfishness, not by sin, but by love, hospitality, and service. And the reason why this is so important, and the reason why I brought up the example of, you know, summer mission is, is that many churches today are tempted to attract people with Christian entertainment, with charismatic speakers, with state-of-the-art technology. And while all of that is great, this passage reminds us that the church is most attractive when its community reflects the gospel through love, hospitality, and service. Do you want to draw people into the church? 
Do you want to draw people to Christ? Develop these kind of relationships. Foster this kind of community where we, we love each other enough to forgive, where we care for each other's needs beyond a minor inconvenience, and we serve one another with the gifts that God has given to us. But again, similar to rejecting sin, building this kind of community isn't easy, which is why, again, why we need to arm ourselves with Christ's attitude. Because it's not easy. Fostering a Christ-like community, it requires commitment, it requires sacrifice, it requires vulnerability. Community requires you to open up your life to others and to put their needs before your own. Community requires you to embrace forgiveness, reconciliation, and all the messiness that come with real relationships. And so again, this is how it ties, that's how this section ties into the beginning. We need to embody Christ's attitude if we're going to build a community that is Christ-like. We need to embrace Christ's attitude that was willing to suffer in order to submit to God. And we need to focus on the big picture that God uses Christian community to reveal the power of the gospel so that others will be drawn to Christ and ultimately be saved. You know, a great example of love, hospitality, and service can actually be seen at the Lord's Supper. Jesus, he's having his last meal with his disciples, and, and he treats them to a meal. Even Judas, who would betray him, he provides him with the meal. And not only that, Jesus, he takes the posture of a servant. He gets down on his hands and knees and he washes the feet of his disciples. And then after that, you know what Jesus says? He says, as I have loved you, so love one another. So even then, Jesus was commanding his disciples to foster a community of love hospitality, and service. How powerful would it be if we took the posture of Jesus? If we put our pride aside and we prioritize people and their needs? What if we were willing to lower ourselves and serve people in any way that we could? I guarantee we would have new visitors. I guarantee that people would take notice that the city of Monrovia, Orange County, Chino, West LA, they would notice your love and they would have curiosity and they'd want to know more. And so I want you to, to take a moment and ask yourself, what is one thing I can do to wash someone's feet? Not literally, but to meet someone's need, to take the posture of a servant for the glory of God. Even though it's not easy, even though it's hard, what's one thing you could do to wash someone's feet? If you're having trouble thinking of something, I got an idea for you. One thing you could do to, to build this kind of community, join a care group. If you want to know one thing that you can do to build a community of hospitality, of love, of service, join a care group. Because that's going to require you to open your life to people. That that's going to require you to make a commitment to people. And that's the first step to building a, a community that glorifies God and that draws people in. And I'll, and I'll take it a step further. As you engage in care group, go beyond your cliques. Look beyond your cliques and, and reach out to the person who's not as popular. Maybe reach out to the person who doesn't have as much to offer. Reach out to the person who, who maybe is a little awkward or you don't click with right away or don't have the greatest chemistry with. Remember, the world uses people for selfish gain. The church cares for people out of selflessness and genuine love. 
And so commit yourself to a care group. And in that care group, be selfless. Be committed. Serve people. Forgive people. And and meet their needs. And again, that's going to help us to build a Christ-like community. And when I talk about committing to care group, I'm not talking about the program. I'm talking about the people. Commit to people and find ways to meet their needs. And if we do that, if we reject sin and we build a community of love, hospitality, and service, the world will take notice. And even though we'll invite the ridicule of some, if we do this, will inspire the faith of many. I'll say that one more time. If we submit to God's will, if we reject sin and we build a community of defined by love, we will invite the ridicule of some, but will inspire the faith of many. And so church, as we close up, I just want to encourage you, be bold in your faith, be courageous, Be willing to suffer and live your faith out loud for the glory of God. And you will see people come to Christ through you. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you so much just for the new life that you have brought us into. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us to stand out so we can be a witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask that you would help us to arm ourselves with Christ's attitude that was willing to obey you to the point of suffering so that, Lord, we will not compromise when confronted with temptation. We will not compromise when we're tempted to blend in, but we will stand firm and honor you with our lives. And and not only that, but, Lord, we'll have the willingness to serve not out of selfish motivations, but out of genuine care. And Lord, I pray that as we do this, as your spirit empowers us, that we will be a witness to our community, that we will turn heads, and that through us, you will change people's hearts and lead people to Christ. And Father, I just want to pray for anyone, anyone who's listening to this right now, who isn't a Christian, who realizes, Lord, that their sin has separated them from you, that realizes that sin is, is, they see the ugliness of it, the destruction of it. Lord, I just ask that you would um, give that person the prompting to put their faith in you, to put their trust in you and your finished work. And if you're hearing this, and if that's you, Put your faith in Jesus and know that if you do so, you will be forgiven of your sin, cleansed, and given a new life. So I just pray for anyone who wants to give their life to you for the first time. Lord, help them to make that decision. Give them the courage. And I pray that you would uh, just let them know, Lord, the second they put their faith in you, that you love them, that they are cleansed and forgiven. And Lord, just be with all of us. Help us to be your faithful witnesses. Help us to be courageous, to suffer, to endure suffering for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Church, God bless you. Thank you so much, Pastor John Mendez, for delivering a powerful and convicting message. If this morning you're saying, Steph, I would like to uh, start a relationship with Jesus. Would you please just go to our website, ifgfla.com, and just click on, I have made a decision to follow Jesus, or I've said yes to Jesus. Or you can go to our app, IFGF Los Angeles app, and also click uh, on the same button, I've said yes to Jesus, and just follow the instruction right there. Did you realize that we are wrapping up with the first month of 2021? So do not be afraid, do not be uh, anxious, uh, cast your cares to God because He cares for you. The same God who is uh, in our destination, He's also in the journey, the living God. The living hope is living in us. Amen. Let's receive the blessing of the Lord. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you are with us in this journey. Um, 
we know that we are victorious people. We are chosen. We are the royal priesthood. We are the holy nation. We've been given the assignment to declare praises to God who took us out of the darkest dark into your marvelous light. So Lord, help us to live with confidence that is founded in you because the joy of the Lord is our strength and we are going to uh, navigate through 2021 victoriously. Church, receive the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord shine His face upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn His face toward you and give you peace. Receive the blessing of the Lord in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, which is in Jesus' name. Everybody said, Amen. Happy Sunday, everybody.